So we are talking about cells at this point. Um, and I want you to be aware of the fact that cells are like ridiculously small. And that might be um, kind of obvious, but like I want to show you just how small they are. Um, so what I'm doing here is I am zooming in. So here is like the text that's on a page that you've printed out. We zoom in farther and farther. Here is like the biggest cells that you're going to see. This is an entire organism right here. Um, the largest human cell is smaller yet even than that, and of course sperm much smaller even than the egg. Um, most of our cells are significantly smaller than the human egg. The human egg actually has like four cells worth of stuff in it combined. Um, and of course cells are filled with uh, things like DNA, things like mitochondria and lysosomes, which we'll be talking about. Um, here is a bacterial cell, and so that is pretty similar in size and shape and a lot of other things to our mitochondria, our cells powerhouses. Um, here is the size of viruses, right? Actually, all of these are viruses, and that's one of the many reasons why they can be so um, troublesome. Um, it's really hard to keep them out because they're so darn tiny. Um, zooming in farther and farther and farther, we'll talk lots about ribosomes today. Um, they actually make proteins. Um, here is phospholipid and glucose, so some of the molecules that we've been talking about so far, and finally a single carbon atom. Um, and so I bring this up because um, it might seem like it would be so much more efficient if we could just make our organs, make our tissues and structures out of just like one big cell instead of a bunch of tiny cells. So really, why do cells have to be that small? And the reason that they have to be that small has everything to do with um, having a large surface area to volume ratio. Okay, so uh, cell size, for the most part, with some exceptions like eggs, um, need to be need to have a lot of opportunities to interact with the outside world or the extracellular environment. Um, you know, the more surface area you have, the more doors you have to enter and exit. So in order to pull stuff in like nutrients and oxygen, in order to spit stuff out that we don't want, like metabolic waste products. Um, and so what this Im image is showing us here um, are three different scenarios, all with the same volume, that is all with the same potential for making proteins, for you know, generating action potentials, all sorts of different things, the same insides, but what is different, different about these is essentially the size of the cells, or these cubes in this case. And so um, we'll look at the two extreme examples here. One four centimeter cube, so like if our cells were huge, um, has a one and a half to one surface area to volume ratio, right? But if we take that same volume and divide it right, into um, 64 of these one inch cubes, so taking a big cell and making them into much smaller pieces, we greatly increase our surface area to volume ratio. And so essentially, take home message here is that our cells are super small so that each one has the ability to metabolize a lot to uh, regulate its internal conditions much more. Okay. Um, our cells are called eukaryotic cells. Um, and without getting into the bio behind all of this, um, eukaryotic cells essentially are what make up everything that you think of as being alive, except for bacteria, archaea, um, and viruses, which aren't technically alive. Um, but plants, mushrooms, um, you know, algae, and us, of course, we are all eukaryotic cells. And so what makes a eukaryotic cell eukaryotic is the fact that um, it has compartments inside of it. Right, so a bacteria, which you can see over here, um, bacterial cell just has everything kind of like floating around within this goo inside the cell. Um, the DNA is next to anything else in the cell, it's not protected. Um, but in our cells, we actually isolate different um, molecular uh, mechanisms, we isolate our DNA away from all of the rest of the stuff going on in the cell. And so these little compartments are bound by the same membrane that is on the outside of our, outside of our cell. Um, and we call them little organs or organelles. Um, and note that this word is blue and underlined, which means that it is um, an important vocabulary. Okay, so um, by compartmentalizing the different uh, functions, 
within our cells. This greatly increases efficiency and it allows um, for more um, fluid communication um, and lets us you know, make all sorts of extra stuff. And of course, it protects things like our DNA, which codes for everything that we are. Um, you may have seen um, an image like this before. Uh, this is a standard eukaryotic cell. Um, now, I will not put one of these things on your lecture exam and say, oh, what is this? And what is this thing over here? That is not what we're here to talk about. Instead, instead of actually like identifying the different components and what they look like, in the lecture, um, what I want you guys to be able to do is talk about the function of these organelles because um, the functions of the organelles give rise to the function of the cell, to the tissue, to the organ, and ultimately to us. And so um, we are going to walk through pretty much all of these organelles together today um, and talk about how they are communicating with each other and working together to keep us alive. Okay, um, I did give you guys um, a link to a crash course video um, on animal cells. Um, I'm sure you've all watched crash course videos before. Um, it's very good, it's always very entertaining. Um, and uh, if you want a little bit of extra review and to see how all these things work together, I definitely recommend um, watching that. Okay, um, but for now, let us focus on um, what's going on in our cells. Um, up here in the corner of these slides, I have that same eukaryotic cell that I just showed you guys. Um, and I have little arrows here that point exactly to where the structures are that we're talking about. So let's talk about our cell um, by referring to what makes it a cell in the first place, right? This membrane that separates inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. And so we know a little bit about this already. Um, we know that our plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, right? So if we zoom in here, we can see that um, there are little spheres, like little blue spheres here, little white spheres down here. Those represent the hydrophilic phosphates, right? So this allows our cells to interact freely with water, both outside the cell out here and inside the cell um, in what is called the cytoplasm. Right, so this word here, cytoplasm, cyto is a root meaning cell, plasm means fluid. And so this membrane actually holds in and surrounds this uh, fluid that is almost like, you know, a little bit runny jello in consistency, um, in which all of the other organelles are suspended. So cytoplasm, an important um, structure. Okay, um, the plasma membrane, um, isn't only made up of phospholipids. Um, as you also know from your biochemistry lecture yesterday, um, there are also little uh, cholesterol molecules wedged in between those lipid tails, which essentially lets your membrane be fluid. Um, and uh, there are videos online where you can actually see um, the surface of the cell kind of waving over it itself. Um, you can think of uh, the consistency of vegetable oil, Right? And so that is what our cell membranes actually are. Um, so I also mentioned in the biochemistry lecture, um, this fluid consistency is really important because we need to be able to move around all of this other stuff that's embedded within our plasma membranes. Um, we can see lots of proteins, right? And some of these proteins have little carbohydrates um, kind of sticking off of them. Um, these structures can function as receptors for communication with other cells. Um, they can function uh, essentially as a cellular fingerprint, right? So the way that our white blood cells know that, you know, this skin cell belongs to us and it doesn't belong to like some scary bacteria or uh, other type of pathogen is by looking at the cellular fingerprint, right? So our uh, white blood cells come along and they look at these things and they say, yep, those look like our stuff. So we're not going to attack that cell. And so uh, all of these things are embedded within this larger plasma membrane. Okay? And so um, this concept is called the fluid mosaic. Right? So lots of phospholipids, lots of cholesterol, lots of proteins or glycoproteins. Okay? Um, any questions so far? If I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. Um, and I can say that uh, I will post this um, on YouTube as well. It just takes a couple hours for that process to happen. 
Okay, um, so uh, what we can see here um, is an image representing the central dogma of biology. Um, and so pretty much everything in biology is built upon this central process. And that is what we are going to be walking through today. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of a preview, this represents a eukaryotic human cell. Um, this blue out here represents the plasma membrane separating the cell from the outside world. And all the way inside the cell is this big nucleus. Okay, and so in the nucleus, that is where we store the DNA. Our DNA is billions of base pairs long, that is billions of nitrogenous bases with their complementary base, so base pairs, billions of base pairs long. Um, and so whenever we want to code for a protein, Right, we want to make lactase because we just drank a glass of milk. We don't want to take all of our DNA and copy all of it and make a protein of all of it. Instead, we make a copy just of that little lactase gene, and that copy is RNA. And the RNA is kind of played with a little bit, and we'll talk about that here soon. And then the mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm, where an organelle called a ribosome is literally going to translate that uh, mRNA. Right, so going from nucleic acid language into a protein language, and we can see here that it's pumping out this little polypeptide. Okay, and then some other things are going to happen to that protein from there, but this really is the central dogma. It is a critically important process uh, to our existence. And so um, what I'm going to do at this point um, is walk you through the slides. Um, we're going to talk about different organelles and what they look like, etc. cetera. Um, but then I'm going to flip back to the whiteboard and um, I highly recommend you guys sketching out with me what this process actually is, so this protein synthesis central dogma process. Okay. Um, so um, we are going to start talking about this process and the organelle in which it uh, begins uh, by talking about the nucleus. Okay, so the nucleus, as I said, is where we store our DNA. Um, because of that, um, it is super important to make sure that nothing gets into or out of the nucleus that we don't really, really want to get into or out of it, right? If we damage our DNA at all, that leads to disease, right? So we talked about how much or many um, diseases are just the, a mutation in the DNA, which leads to a problem with its protein. Okay, so um, we actually have two phospholipid bilayers that surround the nucleus and therefore protect the DNA inside, right? We don't want anything to go wrong here, so we doubly protect it, right? So what we can see here is one phospholipid bilayer and a second phospholipid bilayer separating the nuclear um, environment from the cytoplasm. Okay, there are ways of um, getting stuff in and out of the nucleus, of course, um, and that is with this really specialized basket looking thing called a nuclear pore. Um, and so this uh, nuclear pore has all of this extra protein stuff, which essentially filters out anything that doesn't quite belong. So it is very selective about what the nucleus allows to pass into and out of the cell. Okay, and again, that's um, really important. Okay, so let me um, start drawing some stuff out for you. Um, so, work earlier, um, the screen that you guys see in front of you is going to represent the cell, all right? So all the way on the outside here, this is the cell membrane, okay? We know that it is a phospholipid bilayer. This is outside the cell, and this here is the cytoplasm, so anything on the left side of the screen is inside the cell as the cytoplasm, okay? Um, one blue line actually represents phospholipid bilayer, so two layers of phospholipids, okay? Um, all the way over here, I'm going to draw for you part of the nucleus, all right? So again, this is our nucleus, okay? And, um, we know that the nucleus not only has one phospholipid bilayer, but it has two phospholipid bilayers, just to make sure that everything inside the nucleus is very much protected. 
Okay. Um, inside that nucleus um, is your DNA. And so normally you would think of DNA as being in this nice little like uh, figure eight chromosome or chromatid formation, but that is not the way it is actually stored on a day-to-day -day basis. That configuration really is just present for cell division. Um, and so normally in your nucleus, there is DNA, which is just kind of spread out all over the place, kind of like cotton candy. And so that um, kind of cotton candy configuration is called chromatin. And so that is really important because um, we need to be able to access genes in our DNA. So for example, like this portion of the DNA, that's what codes for lactase. And so we need to be able to get to it. And we couldn't get to it if the DNA was wrapped up in this chromatid form. Okay, so DNA all over the place to the nucleus. Um, there is a region of the nucleus that has particularly condensed DNA. Okay, and so that um, let's see, uh, is a spherical region all the way in the middle. Okay, and that is called the nucleolus. Having a terrible time typing today. Sorry, guys. All right, so that's the nucleolus, and so that's going to become important because um, a lot of particular um, regions of DNA, particular genes of the DNA, are stored within the nucleolus. So hold that thought, we will come back to that. Um, I also want to add in here, just to be thorough, um, our nuclear pores. All right, so the nuclear pores are incredibly selective, um, so selective that they will not allow DNA to pass through them. Right? We want to keep our DNA protected within the nucleus. We don't want it to go um, kind of hanging out within the rest of the cytoplasm. So these nuclear pores will allow RNA out of them, but they will not allow DNA out of them. Okay. Um, any questions so far? All right, very good. Um, go back to our PowerPoint here. Okay, so um, in the nucleus, we have our DNA. Chromatin must remain in the nucleus. The thing is, in order to actually make a protein, so for protein synthesis to occur, we need to get genetic material out into the cytoplasm. Right, protein synthesis is happening out in the cytoplasm. And so in order to make this process happen, we have to first transcribe a particular gene. Right, so you can think of this as like um, a textbook. Right? Textbook has tons of information, all the information about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the human body. But we don't care about all of the information about the human body. Today, we only care about the protein synthesis piece. And so instead of carrying around the entire textbook all the time, you might take notes, literally transcribe word for word in the same language, right, from English to English, transcribe the notes that are important to you and then take only that paper to wherever you need to go. This is exactly the same thing that's happening in the nucleus. We are transcribing, we are copying only the piece of DNA that we actually care about today from DNA, which is a nucleic acid, into RNA, which is another nucleic acid. Okay. Um, and so this process is called transcription. Right. And so um, we'll draw this in in just a second, but this is a little bit more about transcription. Um, what's going to happen and what we'll draw in here is that an enzyme called RNA polymerase is going to literally unzip the genes. Right? So it's going to swirl around, break those hydrogen bonds, and it is going to form bonds. Right, so catalyzing reactions between multiple nucleotides. Okay, these nucleotides, right, the ones that they actually are chosen here, happen to be complementary, right, A's and T's, U's and A's, C's and G's, complementary to the DNA sequence of the gene. Okay, um, does, does that make sense at this point? Um, Let's look at an animation. 
do. Okay, so all sorts of uh, different animations that you can look at. I gave you guys a link for this. Um, but I want to show you transcription. Here we go. All right, so what we have here is DNA, right? We know it's DNA because there are T's that are not used, and also it's double stranded. So when transcription begins, what happens is that an RNA polymerase is going to attach to a promoter region. We're not getting into that kind of level here. Um, it's going to attach to a particular part of the DNA right before the gene that we care about. It is going to break those hydrogen bonds, which are weak in isolation, right? pretty easy to break. And it's going to make a complementary copy of the gene that we care about, right? Only this particular gene, not the rest of the billions of base pairs of DNA, only is this one the one that we care about. And so um, I do want to point out that G's and C's are complementary, right? U and A, so A in the DNA matches with U, uracil, in the mRNA, right? C with G, a T in the DNA matches with A in the RNA, right? So you should be prepared to write out complementary sequences, okay? Um, at the end of the gene, we have a terminator sequence. Again, we're not getting into that level of genetics here, but essentially the RNA polymerase stops, gets lost and goes forth and does wonderful things with its life. And so this right here is what we actually care about. This is going to be the copy, that little bit of notes from the textbook that you're going to carry around because that's what you care about today. Um, also note that five prime is the beginning, three prime is the end. Okay. All right, going back to our drawing here. Okay, so um, what we have now is you know, just the nucleus. Here's the DNA. This is the gene that we care about um, in the DNA. Okay, so we're going to complete the process of transcription, right, which is um, uh, which is copying DNA into RNA. And we'll write that out here. So DNA into mRNA is what transcription actually is. Okay, so if this is the gene that we care about, we are going to draw, or yeah, we're going to draw in in RNA polymerase. All right, so this is not necessarily very pretty. It is shockingly difficult to draw with the mouse. <laughs> All right, so here is RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase, as we know, is going to um, copy DNA. Okay. And so what we end up with is an exactly complementary sequence to the DNA here. But wait, we're not done yet. So this is the mRNA. Are you guys following that at this point? I don't want to leave you behind with this little uh, silliness here. Okay. There's the mRNA. Okay. Um, the mRNA is not quite ready to leave the comfort of the nucleus through the nuclear pore and at, exit out into the cytoplasm just yet. We actually have to um, play with it a little bit. We have to process it. And this is called post-transcriptional processing. So kind of step two here is the post-transcriptional processing. sense. All right. Um, so let's see what that looks like. All right. First of all, um, for a lot of different reasons, evolutionarily, our genes are not just containing coding information. That is, every single nucleotide sequence does not code directly for a protein. Um, instead, our genes are actually made up of some regions that actually count and some regions 
that used to be called garbage DNA. We know a little bit better than that now. Um, but pretty much, there's only po portions that actually code for a protein. And so before we take that piece of notebook paper out into the world, we want to kind of get rid of all the stuff that doesn't really mean anything to us, right? So only taking the highlighted portions, not all of the extra information that you don't really need. And so we have names for this, of course, it's anatomy after all. Um, the introns are the non-coding regions. The exons are the coding regions. And I know this is completely backwards from what you want it to be. Um, you'd want the exons to exit and you'd want the introns to remain in the mRNA. It's exactly opposite, right? It's just like plural means shin and sural means calf, right? The C's and S's are just switched. Okay. Um, so what happens in the nucleus before the mRNA is allowed to leave the nucleus is that the introns, so this little blue region right here, um, is actually cut away by these cute little motors called SNRPs. Um, so the introns are cut away and they are recycled and the exons are glued together. They are spliced together by another enzyme. So this is the final mRNA code, which is going to give rise to a particular protein. Okay, so the post-transcriptional processing includes removal of introns, splicing together of exons. Okay, so this is just another way of showing you this. Um, the non-coding introns are removed and the coding exons are spliced together. So this is the mature processed mRNA. Okay, two more things have to happen before the mRNA can leave. <laughs> it just keeps going and going, right? Um, so the mRNA must also be kind of doctored up Right, so we have the sequence that we're going to use to make a protein at this point, but we do not have um, kind of signaling molecules on either end. All right, so um, we know that the beginning of a molecule is the five prime end. Right, so up here, the five prime end is the one closest to the phosphate. This is where all of the enzymes are going to start reading this particular mRNA. But just that five prime end isn't quite enough to like flag down those enzymes. And so we actually add a cap, so a molecule, onto the very beginning of the mRNA on the five prime end, so that um, essentially the ribosomes, right, with all these enzymes in there, um, can say, hey, here's the beginning, start reading here, and then you can make protein. Okay, so we add a five prime cap. That's the second thing after the splicing. Um, and the third thing is adding a three prime poly A tail. Now remember, I told you that. Um, the oxygen or not on the second prime carbon essentially indicates to enzymes that RNA can be broken down and disposed of, and DNA, like you better not touch that, you better leave the DNA alone. Um, and so while protein synthesis is happening in the cytoplasm, enzymes are coming along and they're starting to eat away at the tail of that mRNA sequence, right? So in order to kind of slow down that degradation process, we add a bunch of junk to the end of the mRNA, right? So essentially we add a lot of adenines, right? Poly A, polyadenine tail, so that when those enzymes come along and they start chomping down and degrading that three prime end, they can break down a bunch of junk first before it actually gets to the coding region. Does that make sense? No, it's all sorts of things uh, to visualize here. All right then. Okay, so we made our mRNA via transcription. We have processed said mRNA, but we don't exactly have all the pieces to this puzzle just yet. And to talk about the rest of this puzzle, we need to go back to that nucleolus. Okay, so remember nucleolus is this densely packed region of DNA in the middle of the nucleus. Within the nucleolus, there are particular genes that code for um, rRNA and tRNA. So if you remember from yesterday's lecture on biochemistry, um, rRNA is part of ribosomes, and those are organelles that are doing the translating, um, and tRNA literally transfers amino acids to the ribosomes, 
right? So in order to get those ribosomes and tRNAs to begin with, we actually need to go through the same exact process we did for mRNA, but this time within the nucleolus. Okay, so let's uh, go back to our drawing here. Okay. Um, so after the post-transcriptional processing, we allow this mRNA to exit the nucleus via the nuclear pores out into the cytoplasm. Right? But we're not quite ready just yet to translate it. Okay? Before that happens, we also need, you know, kind of step three, although this is really always happening, we need to transcribe rRNA and tRNA. Okay? And again, that is going to happen within the nucleolus. Okay, so ultimately those things that tRNA and uh, rRNA actually constructed into ribosomes are going to also leave the nucleus via those nuclear pores. Okay, so finally we have all of the pieces of this puzzle to start the process of translation. And translation really is a big one. All right, so translation is taking those notes that you took, you copied literally directly from the textbook, and translating it into a different language. So all of a sudden you want to learn AMP in Spanish, and so you take those notes and you translate it into Spanish. And so that's exactly what's happening here. We take the nucleic acid language and we translate that same information, that same code, into the amino acid or the protein language. Okay. And so, um, have all sorts of colors here. Um, we have a ribosome, and I'm drawing this huge because um, we're going to need it huge. Uh, this is our thing, our ribosome. Okay, we made it up here in the nucleolus, right? We made our RNA, put it together with some proteins, and now here we are um, out here. Okay, um, we also have our mRNA. Okay, so this long skinny strand here is our mRNA. Okay, so this, um, in theory, is the three prime end of that mRNA, which means this over here would be our five prime end of that mRNA. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the tRNAs in just a moment. Um, keep in mind that the um, red line here is representing a sequence, right? A's, G's, C's, and U's within this mRNA. Okay, so let's go back to our notes here for just a second. Okay. And talk a little bit more about the ribosomes. Yeah, so the ribosomes are the one type of um, organelles that we're talking about today that doesn't actually have a membrane. Right? These are actually so primitive that they don't have a phospholipid bilayer. Um, we see these in bacteria as well. Um, and so literally the ribosome is just rRNA and proteins clumped together into two subunits. So here's a subunit and here's a subunit. And they essentially like sandwich down on either side of the mRNA. Okay, so the five prime end, and here is the sequence of mRNA that we just copied. Okay. Ribosomes are responsible for translating the mRNA, HGCs and U's, into the protein language. And so up here, this is representing an amino acid. Okay. Ribosomes are generally circulating around within the cytoplasm, essentially looking for any mRNA. Okay. Um, however, in some circumstances, which we are going to get into today, here soon, um, these free ribosomes actually bind to another type of organelle. And so that's what these little lines here are. Um, that's another organelle called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and so we're going to look at ribosomes that are free, free floating around and those bound ribosomes. Okay. Um, okay, so what we are going to see here is the translation process. Um, in order to convert the 
sequence of nucleotides, so the nucleic acid language, into the amino acid language of proteins, we need to look at the words, right? So each three nucleotide letter sequence codes for a particular amino acid. Okay? That is, one word in nucleotides means this particular amino acid um, is next in the protein. And so we know um, which three letter sequence or which codon on the mRNA is going to code for which amino acid in the protein by looking at a chart like this, right? So if you have an AUC, you're going to bring this particular amino acid. If you have a CCC, you're going to bring this one, a proline, for example. And so the, uh, the structure, structures responsible for actually delivering or quite literally transferring this phenylalanine to the ribosome when this particular codon is detected is our friend, the tRNA. Okay, so um, on one side of the tR tRNA molecule, um, we have an anticodon. So this is the exact complementary sequence to the codon on mRNA. Given this codon, which matches this anticodon, the tRNA is going to bring this particular amino acid. Okay. Um, and so, again, the codon is on the mRNA, the anticodon is on the tRNA, the amino acid is delivered by the appropriate tRNA. Um, so, once again, I want to um, show you a little animation um, so that you can visualize this before uh, we try to draw it in. Okay, so again, this is the process of translation. What we have here is an mRNA sequence. Here's the end, the three prime end, with lots of those um, adenines, right? The poly A tail, lots of junk at the end. Um, here is the five prime cap, the GTP. Okay, so flagging down the ribosome, hey, this is the beginning. Okay, so what's going to happen is half of the ribosome, the small ribosome, the subunit, is going to see that five prime cap bind to one side of the mRNA. And it's pretty much going to start looking for the beginning of the sequence coding for a protein. Okay? That is, there is one particular codon that always says this is the beginning of the protein. Okay? Um, there can be dozens, there can be hundreds of other nucleotides over here. Don't mean anything until we get to what is called the start codon. The start codon is here, A-U-G always, no matter what, right? If we look at that chart, which we'll go back to in just a second, um, AUG always codes for a methionine. So methionine is the beginning of every protein ever, okay? So again, small ribosomal subunit looked for the start codon, right? Once the start codon is found, a tRNA with the appropriate anticodon right here is going to bind to that AUG, bringing with it its methionine. Okay, from there, the large ribosomal subunit, so the other half of this uh, organelle, is going to literally sandwich all of this stuff together, right? The mRNA, the tRNA, and, you know, the two halves of the ribosomal subunit. Okay, from there, the next codon is going to essentially call for the next amino acid. Okay, here AAG is going to code for lysine, Okay, and so then what? Now we have two amino acids, two tRNAs, and mRNA. What next? Well, the ribosome is going to catalyze the reaction between methionine and lysine, right? As we know from our biochemistry talk, this is a dehydration synthesis reaction. The ribosome, or the enzymes within the ribosome, pull water out and join methionine and lysine together with a peptide bond. Okay, that was a lot. Um, you can watch this again, or I can repeat it if you would like. Um, okay. All right, so once that peptide bond has been formed between the two amino acids, the entire ribosome complex, large and small subunits, shifts down, reading along the mRNA. Okay, 
that empty tRNA can get lost, can go forth and find another methionine to bring somewhere else. And then the next tRNA is going to arrive. Okay, so now we have a codon UUU. Okay. Um, the complementary sequence is AAA, that is the empty codon on the tRNA. And this particular codon, UUU, codes for phenylalanine. Okay, so once again, the ribosomal enzymes are going to catalyze a reaction between lysine and phenylalanine, um, that is pulling water out, forming a peptide bond between the carboxyl of one and the amine group of the other. Okay. Once again, everything moves over, tRNA gets lost, and the next tRNA comes in. And so this process is going to continue all the way until we come to a stop codon, okay, which should be this next one here. Okay, so um, this is a stop codon right here. Um, let's go back to our um, slides here. Um, note that when we, um, when we look at this chart, um, every possible combination of nucleotides calls for a particular type of those 20 amino acids. There are three exceptions, UAA, UAG, and UGA are all stop codons. So they don't actually code for anything, but they pretty much uh, tell the ribosome that we're done making a protein, detach and release that chain of amino acids out into the cytoplasm. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Or rather, if it doesn't make sense, Okay. All right. Um, so here is um, pretty much just spelling all of that stuff out for you, right? Starts the start code on AUG, and then all of these things happen. Um, oh, also, this here is that link to all of those lovely bio animations. Um, hopefully, um, you can benefit from that. All right. So let's go back to our whiteboard here. Okay. Um, so I want to add in a sequence here, just a random sequence. Okay, so um, this is essentially um, zooming in on the sequence in the mRNA. Okay, so we're going to draw this in. Um, essentially, the large and small ribosomal subunits are going to, well, actually, this isn't here yet. Um, so small ribosomal subunit is going to find this five prime cap, and it's going to start reading this sequence until it finds the AUG, that is the start codon. And so from there, then and only then, will a tRNA deliver its appropriate amino acid, right? So here is a tRNA binding, right? It's shaped roughly like a T. Again, sorry for my bad drawing here. Um, but um, if we look at that uh, chart, um, we can see that the appropriate amino acid is going to be methionine. Um, and you absolutely do not have to memorize um, which amino acids goes to which codon. That is not at all what we're here for. Um, just the process is good. Okay, so tRNA brings methionine. Large ribosomal subunit is going to attach. Okay, and then um, do. And then the next tRNA is going to arrive. All right, so AAC is the next one. Oh my gosh, it's so ugly. Um, and I can look this up for you. Um, what do we have? We have AAC. So if you look at that little chart, it's AAC is ASN. Okay, so um, as we saw, 
the ribosome is going to catalyze the reaction between methionine or met and acin, um, thus detaching methionine from the tRNA. And then the tRNA is able to get lost. Okay. Um, and so this is going to keep on happening, right? So the ribosome keeps on sliding down the mRNA, just adding more and more to this chain. Questions? Okay, very good. Um, hopefully you guys are getting this pretty well. Um, so there are different types of proteins as we know. Um, some proteins are going to just kind of hang out in the cytoplasm. Some are going to become embedded in a membrane, right? Like this nuclear pore right here. Some proteins like hormones, for example, like uh, mucus, mucin, um, is going to actually be secreted outside of the cell. And so, um, for most proteins, this cytoplasmic ribosome is not the end of the story. Okay, so um, if we are talking about a protein that is going to become part of the membrane, part of an organelle, or extracellular secreted outside of the cell, this entire process is going to continue on another organelle. Uh, this organelle is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, so the RER. Um, and I drew it up here because it's technically um, kind of a, an extension off of the nucleus. Okay. Um, nope, that's not gonna work. Um, all right, so um, if a particular sequence is seen within this um, sequence of mRNA. What's going to happen is that the ribosome, the mRNA right, and that little um, protein right, that's starting to be formed is all going to slide over and attach to the RER. So let me uh, let me show you a little video clip this time. Oops, not that one. All right, so we're looking for a video. Here we go. Um, so what this is is the ribosome and the mRNA. This clip is going to show you how this entire thing is going to slide over and attach to the RER if this protein is destined to leave the cell, for example. Right, so very quick. Many proteins need to enter the ER for modification with sugars. This occurs at the same time that they are being synthesized by the ribosome. Translation begins with synthesis of a short signal peptide sequence. A signal recognition particle, a protein complex, binds to the signal peptide while translation continues. The SRP then binds to its receptor in the ER membrane, anchoring the ribosome. The ribosome binds its receptor, and the signal peptide meets the protein translocator. Translation proceeds, and the protein passes through the translocator. The signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide, leaving the new protein molecule in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Um, so there's a lot more words in there than you need for this class. Um, so yay, that's good, right? Um, but let's see. Um, all right, what I do want to continue with here though is talking about the rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? So again, we can see in our cell here, surrounding the nucleus are these series of flattened saccules. Okay, that is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or the RER. Um, the reason it's called rough is because it is covered with ribosomes, and those ribosomes are still working on those proteins. They're still translating those proteins, but now the protein is going inside the RER. And so what exactly does the RER do? Well, the RER is going to take that protein and it's going to process it a little bit. Okay, so first of all, it's going to um, fold those proteins into their tertiary structure, 
right? So the secondary structure is alpha helices and beta plated sheets. That just kind of happens. The endoplasmic reticulum is going to fold those proteins into a more globular structure. Also, um, as we saw in the plasma membrane, some proteins have little carbohydrates sticking off of them, and that kind of acts like our cellular fingerprint. So we can recognize what's us and what is not us, and we can get lost. Um, and so, the RER is what actually plants those carbohydrates um, and attaches them to the proteins, um, but it just kind of like throws them on there. So it's, um, you know, in introductory bio back in the day, uh, my professor talked about it like planting hedges, like big unruly hedges that only later become trimmed and actually specific to us. Okay, so um, let's go back here. Okay, so what we can see up here um, is um, the, let's see, we're at step number five here. This is the RE, or sorry, the ribosome finishes the protein, right? So it reaches that stop codon, and then the RER um, is going to fold the protein into its secondary and tertiary um, shape, and it's going to add carbs. Okay, um, so all of that stuff is happening way up here. Okay, um, okay so again, that's the rough end of plasma reticulum. Um, we're not done yet, right? First of all, there's often a quaternary shape in proteins, um, and secondly, um, the RER doesn't necessarily um, have the ability to ship these proteins out to their final destination. So what does have that ability, um, as we will see here, um, is yet another membrane-bound structure. Okay, so again, all of these blue lines are representing um, phospholipid bilayers. Okay, this particular uh, organelle is called the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body, okay, and it happens to be all the way on the other side of the cell, right? So that's yet another um, challenge that we are going to be experiencing. We need to get this protein, this little brown squealy over here, from the RER all the way across the cell to the Golgi apparatus, which is finally going to finish up this protein and finish up this story once and for all. Okay, so. Um, ah, and here is another image just showing you how the ribosome um, finishes up with its little, uh, with its translation by kind of injecting this protein into the RER. Okay, um, so step number four here in this image is the protein with these little green carbohydrate hedges. It's folded into its secondary and tertiary shape. Now what we are going to do is we are going to bud off a little piece of that phospholipid bilayer Right? Like it's, it's just made out of oils, right? So it's going to automatically form these little droplets with, um, with a protein inside, and we can ship that vesicle off to the opposite side of the cell. Okay, um, so hold that thought for right now. Um, we're going to pause protein synthesis um, because there's yet another organelle with a really similar name to the RER that I just want to kind of throw in here because it sounds so similar and I want to make the distinction between the two. So um, this organelle, again, not involved in protein synthesis, but sounds kind of similar to one that is, um, is the SER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, again, this is just another extension off of the nucleus, right? so more little flattened saccules, but this time it's smooth. It is not covered by these little spots here, which are in fact the ribosomes. Um, the RER processes proteins, the SER processes lipids. And so um, in organs that have, uh, have this role, right, so they are responsible for processing food, they're responsible for um, detoxifying things, so for example, the liver, um, there is a lot of smooth endoplasmic to do. And so the SER is responsible for um, modifying cholesterol um, in such a way that we can make steroid hormones out of it. Um, we can 
make triglycerides, right? So actually make storage molecules of fat as opposed to uh, glycerol. Um, the SER is what is actually responsible for detoxifying drugs um, and other types of chemicals, either intentionally or unintentionally in your body. Um, it is the SER, um, specifically of your liver and your kidney cells, that actually break those chemicals down. Um, and also the SER is really important in this um, metabolism, this energy balance, um, sugar versus glycogen versus triglycerides and how exactly we go from one to the other to the other to fuel the needs of the cell and of course of the entire body. And so uh, the last note about the SER is that um, not all cells and not all people are created equally with this. Um, you can have more or less SER depending on what you do with your life. So for example, um, if you are um, frequently drinking alcohol, right, of course alcohol is processed by your liver, but specifically by the SER of those liver cells. Um, and so when the demand for this function um, becomes greater and greater, you actually increase the amount of SER you have within your cells. Um, so that was a side note. Again, SER is not dealing with proteins, it's dealing with lipids. Let's go back to proteins. Okay, so what we have talked about so far is transcription in the nucleus, processing of the mRNA in the nucleus, release of the uh, mRNA into the cytoplasm where the, uh, the ribosomes are going to um, are going to translate um, that mRNA. Um, ribosomes are then going to take their processes and actually release those proteins into the RER. Okay, so now these little blue squiggles here are the proteins. We need to get the proteins all the way over here to the Golgi, which is going to finally finish this big clunky process. So, um, the way that we do that is with transport vesicles. Um, again, we literally bud off a piece of the plasma membrane, the, or sorry, the phospholipid bilayer of the rough ER, and we ship it across the cell, and that little oily droplet is literally going to fuse with the membrane of the Golgi apparatus, right? So the, um, the nucleus and the RER and the Golgi and all these membrane-bound organelles all have the same stuff making up their membranes. So the membranes are more or less interchangeable. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's add this new detail in. Okay, so the RER is going to bud off a little piece of its membrane. Okay, and within that little vesicle here is the protein which needs to get shipped across the cell. Okay, um, ultimately there's this little protein called, oops, uh, called dynamin, uh, which literally like dynamites this off so that it's its own independent vesicle. Okay, um, We'll take a look at a little molecular motor here soon that actually is responsible for carrying this vesicle with little cute feet all the way to the gold. Okay, so we'll get back there. Uh, but for now, uh, this vesicle is going to fuse with the Golgi apparatus. The protein is going to be dumped inside, and it's going to be passed from one of these little saccules to the next, to the next. Okay, so what exactly is happening in the Golgi apparatus? Why do we need the Golgi apparatus? Um, well, if you um, remember from high school bio or um, college bio, um, the Golgi apparatus is kind of like um, the cells, um, what do they call it, post office, right? So it ultimately um, packages proteins up, it organizes them, um, it puts them into their quaternary structure, right? So the four subunits of hemoglobin are stuck together within the Golgi apparatus, they're packed up, and then they go for um, off, you know, into the world where they need to go. Um, and so here are the uh, final uh, processes here. Um, the production of proteins is finished. 
those carbohydrate hedges are finally trimmed, right? So they do act as a fingerprint and they're not just these big gangly chains of, uh, of glucose on the surface of our cells. And finally, it is going to ship off these little vesicles, okay? Um, so uh, this kind of summarizes this process here, right? So transcription, translation starts out here, translation finishes in the RER, a transport vesicle is shipped across the cell, fuses with the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi apparatus finalizes the proteins, and from there, the vesicles that are budding off of the Golgi apparatus can either remain as uh, their own independent organelles, right? So for example, um, this here is uh, a lysome, we'll look at that in a second. So that is just the vesicle that butted off the Golgi that is now more or less the cell's stomach. Um, or we can have what is called exocytosis or secretion of whatever that uh, protein product actually is. Um, let's, last little animation here for you guys. So once again, going back to these wonderful little diagrams here, um, here is all of the stuff we just talked about, but of course, much, much simpler. It's gonna go through pretty fast. Transcription, translation, RER processing, shipping to the Golgi, our Golgi processing, breaking off, and secretion out of the cell. All right, so everything I just talked about in literally five seconds, okay? So, um, Again, this is a wildly helpful website, hopefully. Okay. All right, let's finish up with this diagram here, finally. Um, all right, so let's add this in to be thorough. Um, step number six is the transport vesicle. Um, ships the protein to the Golgi. Uh, the Golgi, number seven, is going to process into the quaternary structure, trims those carbohydrates, and also it is going to um, sort and send off these proteins. And once we have that uh, vesicle full of protein, the vesicle can ultimately release these protein contents out into the world. So as secretion or the vesicles themselves can become their own, do their own organelles. Okay. Once again, are we okay with that? You guys are still there? All right. Um, finishing up. All right, so um, what exactly can these transport vesicles become? Well, they can become their own organelles. Um, here we see the Golgi releasing this vesicle off of it that is chock full of digestive enzymes. And so um, these digestive enzymes can essentially um, break down anything that the uh, cell takes into it, um, whether it's a white blood cell breaking down a bacteria that's invaded our body, or um, you know, anything, like right? anytime the cell takes something inside of it. Um, so actually these vesicles uh, have a really low pH as well, so it literally is like a stomach. And so when our cells take in something foreign, the lysosome can fuse to that particular vesicle, dumping all of its digestive enzymes onto it, and then breaking down um, that ingested substance. Um, another type of organelle that is directly derived from Golgi apparatus function um, are the peroxisomes. Um, so the perox uh, is referencing the fact that these organelles produce um, hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct of breaking down excess lipids. Um, and so, of course, we have an, yet another enzyme which breaks down hydrogen peroxide so that we don't poison our own cells. Um, but peroxisomes are important in lipid balance as well. Okay, so that is the end of 
protein synthesis. Um, you guys should become familiar with that um, in detail. Um, there will be an open-ended component of your upcoming lecture exam that is directly, you know, you explaining that process. Um, in the past, I've had students um, write it out, draw it out, um, and just submit, you know, that written documentation of your understanding. Um, this term, because of the weird position we're all in, um, I thought we'd try out a video narration. And so I don't need to see your face if you don't want to, um, and I'll explain this more um, in, in the assignment um, tomorrow. But uh, pretty much um, what I would want you to do is like draw it out or like have a diagram of it and like you point, this is what's happening here, this is what's happening here, and this is what's happening here. And that will actually count as part of your lecture exam. And so again, um, protein synthesis, that whole thing that I just drew on the whiteboard in this video, um, is really important for you to be able to talk about. Okay? And also there'll be some multiple choice questions on it as well. Okay? Um, so hint it, nudge, nudge, really study that. It's really important. Okay. There are a few more structures within the cell that are going to become important to us. So let's fly through those um, once and for all. Okay. Uh, the mitochondria, the cell's powerhouses, um, evolved from endosymbiosis of another uh, prokaryotic organism. As a result, they also have multiple layers of phospholipid bilayer. And this is really important because we actually create um, concentration gradients over them and use that, um, that potential energy to actually generate most of our cell's energy. And so we'll get into those details later this semester, but for now, know that in order to get the most ATP, out of a single glucose molecule, right, glucose ready energy, ATP cellular currency, um, we need the mitochondria. Okay? And so the byproducts of mitochondria are carbon dioxide. Right? So every exhale that you take is you breathing out the products of your mitochondria. Okay? Um, also, the mitochondria has its own plastid DNA. That means it's a circle as opposed to um, a chromatid in shape. Um, and the mitochondrial DNA is actually only passed down from your mom, so not your dad's DNA at all. So if there was ever a reason to do a maternity test as opposed to a paternity test, um, you can very easily use mitochondrial DNA. Um, it's actually been used in some uh, kind of crazy research as well. Um, anyway, uh, mitochondria, the cell's powerhouse, um, and uh, the mitochondria complete aerobic respiration. Um, so you can still gain energy from glucose without the mitochondria, but it is very, very small. And so we'll talk about this when we get into muscles later this term. Um, the final kind of group of structures within, uh, within the cells is called the cytoskeleton. Again, um, cyto means cell. So this is the skeleton, the structures within the, cy the cyto, the cell. Okay, so these are um, a network of protein fibers. Generally, they are constantly being created and um, modified by what's called the centriole. Um, centriole is only an animal structure as well. Um, what we can see is that um, sometimes the cytoskeleton really is as simple as um, kind of an internal skeleton like our own, like pushing out on that really uh, oily membrane and keeping it from kind of collapsing on itself. Um, so that's what we see here in green. Um, these fluorescently dyed cytoskeleton fibers are showing you how the proteins push out and keep kind of inflated your cells. Um, also, they provide protection of like the nucleus. And again, we really need to protect our DNA. And so we have extra proteins that support that nuclear envelope. Um, but also these fibers can help our cells to move, right? So you can think of a sperm cell as swimming around. Um, that is a part of cytoskeleton. Um, and transporting organelles, right? So let's take a look at the three types of cytoskeleton fibers. Um, the thinnest of all are the actin filaments, um, and they um, provide strength to the, scale, to the cell. Sorry. Um, here, again, is our phospholipid bilayer with embedded cholesterol and proteins. And on the inside, so on the cytoplasm side of this membrane, we can see lots of little yellow fibers. Right? So that is actin. And again, that is keeping that oily membrane kind of inflated. 
um, these active filaments link transmembrane proteins to cytoplasmic proteins. That is, these are transmembrane. They are actually going across the membrane. Um, and so these are held in place by actin. Um, actin is important in mitosis. So actually, you know, starting with one cell and then actual cell division into two independent daughter cells, that is only possible because of actin. Um, and maybe most interestingly to us, this is how your muscles contract. Right? So we'll talk all about this within a couple weeks. This is actin, this is myosin, and essentially um, these fibers interact in such a way that like the myosin heads are going to like pull on the actin and it actually shortens your muscles. So um, kind of kind of fun and very important function of actin. Um, intermediate filaments are, as you might imagine, intermediate in size between actin and the microtubules. Um, they provide lots of support and structure to the cell. So when we looked at these little green um, fluorescent fibers here, those are intermediate filaments. Um, they also do things like um, support our neurons. Um, so if you think about the fact that single neuron, single uh, nervous tissue cells go from the tips of your fingers all the way up into your spinal cord, right? That's an individual cell that's several feet long. And of course, they're super skinny. And so um, the fact that we're moving around all the time makes them, um, you know, easy to kink and easy to, in fact, break. And so we have to reinforce those um, those neurons with what are called neurofilaments. Otherwise, they would just sever and we couldn't control our body. Okay. Um, microtubules. Um, although the name suggests that they are so very tiny, um, they are in fact the largest of the uh, cytoskeleton fibers. Um, instead of just being chains of amino acids, they are chains of amino acids that kind of go around in a spiral, or a hollow tube, a micro tube. Um, to create a relatively thick um, structure. Um, and so, um, again, uh, the centriole or centrosome um, is a structure within the cell that is constantly making microtubules and breaking them down. Um, so we're constantly like rerouting things all over our cells. Um, perhaps uh, my favorite uh, microtubule function is to act as train tracks. Um, for the transport of substances throughout the cell. So this here is a vesicle, for example, filled with a protein that's going from the RER to the Golgi apparatus, and this here is a molecular motor. So um, I like this so much that I want to show you a little video of exactly how this thing works, um, because it's charming and it's incredible to think that all this stuff is happening um, in your cells right now. Okay, so this is actually um, a clip from a scientist that made all sorts of little bio animations, and he's going to show you microtubules and molecular motors. Together to build a road. But as you can see, they grow from little subunit, little smaller proteins coming together. And this happens all the time. It's happening all so the time. So the bones go where they need it. Right? Yes. Like yes, absolutely. And, and now this is a more complex fiber. Those are coming to be. Exactly. They're just falling apart. And it does this as required. Yes. So we're going to create highways or bones of the skin. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yes. Now, this, <laughs> this is a protein called a motor protein. This is a real. That, it is real. That's walking along one of those microtubules. It's pumping thing? Yes. What is it? What is it? Dragging a huge sac. So it's dragging this membrane sac full of proteins. This is the stuff we want to get out of the cell. Now, how does it? Okay. Um, Maybe less amusing to everybody else, but I think it's delightful. Um, anyway, um, that's a molecular motor. That is literally how we get the proteins from the RER to the Golgi and the Golgi to anywhere else. Right? So molecular motors using an ATP for every little one of those steps along the microtubule highway. Um, and again, as they said, um, the microtubules are constantly being constructed and deconstructed so that we only um, have these things exactly where they need to be. Um, all right, so um, microtubules are also responsible for movement of the entire cell or movement of substances over the surface of cells. Um, a flagellum is made of multiple microtubules in this characteristic ring structure, right? Looks the same no matter what flagellum you're looking at. Um, and of course, this is surrounded by plasma membrane and sticks out on um, the side of the cell. Um, now, if you were to look 
inside the cell, you would see that this microtubule flagellum um, actually has a really complex mechanism that's embedded within the cell itself. Um, and so uh, these are little like gears and they're going to turn around and around and around. And you note that there is a hook here. Right? So the flagellum isn't just sticking right out, there's a hook. And so as the gears turn inside our cells, um, the hook, right, it turns around. And so essentially the flagellum has this like whip-like motion, which actually um, clumsily, in fact, um, propels, um, for example, sperm through a fluid. Okay. Um, so shockingly complex here. Um, another kind of modification to these microtubule flagella are cilia. Um, and so in the lab, lab video that I have for you guys today, um, I talked very briefly about cilia. So here we have um, these little finger-like or hair-like projections um, made of the same stuff, the same microtubules that are on the surface of the cell. Um, here's the lumen or the opening, for example, in your trachea, your windpipe. Um, and these little cilia actually kind of make wave-like motions to propel mucus along the surface of your trachea, for example. And so the purpose of that is to trap any pollen or dust or bacteria, whatever that is on its way down into your lungs, it tr the mucus traps all that stuff and the cilia actually push the mucus and all that extra gunk along and you ultimately swallow it, whether you want to think about it or not, you swallow all that stuff and your stomach can break it down so that it's no longer a problem. 